beloved people of God, good morning. good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome on this fifth Sunday of Easter. I'm pretty sure that's where we're at in the liturgical calendar. Uh, <laughs> we're delighted that you're here with us this morning, either in person or via computer. Um, we do have several folks still joining us online, so that video will get posted later. Um, and if you're ever looking for a video of a worship service, uh, you can find those on our YouTube channel, to which there is a link in the Parkwood Press. So, as we gather, a few announcements and reminders. First up is you started seeing advertisements, maybe Facebook posts, uh, pleas in the press uh, for the Collected Treasures and Artisan Gifts Craft Market. That will be held on September 11th this year. And I wanted to give you a little bit of background as to where that came from. If you took a look at our annual report, um, you may have noticed that we have a budget deficit for this year. We are expected to wind up a little bit in the red. So this came to life as a fundraiser for the church. So any proceeds from that craft sale will go directly to the mission and ministry of Parkwood. Um, there are no kind of special projects that that's going to. This is just, again, for our mission and ministry as a congregation. So we invite you, if you are creative in any way, shape, or form, uh, to sign up to donate items that we can sell, or if you know of folks who may be interested in becoming a vendor and having their own booth, uh, there are applications available for that as well. And as always, all of that information is in the Parkwood Press. If you're ever wondering about something, it's probably in the Parkwood Press. I also want to note that in two weeks is Pentecost Sunday. Um, this is the day we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the quote-unquote birthday of the church. Um, and it's also the day that we collect the Pentecost offering. Now, I did not check my calendar. Do we have someone from the mission committee who's going to talk about that today? Next week. Next week. All right. So the Pentecost offering is one of our four special offerings from the PCUSA. This is one of the ways that we participate with our larger denomination. Um, and we'll get you some more information about where all of that goes next week. You may have also noticed that today is a Communion Sunday. Um, we're celebrating that a little bit differently still due to COVID-19 restrictions, but rest assured, I will give instructions. I know it's been a while for some of us. So, and please participate as you feel most comfortable. I also want to note, I warned the ushers about this before worship, but after the benediction, starting this Sunday, I am going to go and hang out in the foyer so that I can say hello to all of you as you leave. So once I do the benediction, I'm going to walk out those doors. I'm not running away, I promise. <laughs> um, I just want to give you all that heads up that that's going to be different um, starting today. Do we have any other announcements for us today? All right. With all of that said, let us worship God together. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. In the wilderness, water brings life. Seek us out, O God, and take us to water. In the word of God, we find our good news. Seek us out, O God, and fill us with understanding. In the bread and the cup, Christ nourishes all people. Seek us out, O God, and give us yourself. We gather now around the water of life, the word that illumines and the food that nourishes body and soul. Come and praise the vine that gives all good things.
We come in confession not because we fear retribution of our failures and our missteps, but because we know to expect to receive both forgiveness for our past, a renewed life for our future, and so we pray together. God of mercy, we confess that we have not produced the fruit of the Spirit. We have not loved others as you have loved us. We have not been patient. We have rejected joy. We have chosen retribution over kindness and peace. Forgive us, O Lord God, and restore us so that we may abide in your love and live out your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. You've already been cleansed by the word that God has spoken to you. In baptism, God claimed you and joined you to Christ. As branches to a vine, believe the promise given to you in that moment. We are washed clean, we are forgiven, and we are clean and made anew. Thanks be to God. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, that through your word we may be guided into the love of God for all the world. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of the Lord. As we begin to wrap up the season of Easter, we get to spend some time with the stories and metaphors that Jesus used to describe himself and his ministry. If you were with us last week, there we go. If you were with us last week, you'll remember that Jesus called himself the Good Shepherd in John chapter 10. This week, we catch up with Jesus in chapter 15. This is right in the middle of what's called Jesus' farewell discourse, in which he offers some final advice encouragement, and teaching to his disciples on the same night that he is arrested. 
It spans from John chapter 13, when he washes their feet, to the beginning of chapter 18, when he's arrested. This is important context, because we need to receive these words knowing what Jesus knows. That he won't be with these disciples in the same way for much longer. Let us listen now for the word of the Lord from John 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's talk about fruit. When I was around eight years old, one of my great uncles decided it was time to thin out his small orchard. He was a farmer, and apparently, peaches grew surprisingly well in rural Illinois. So he had peach trees. He gave my dad and my grandmother each a couple of cuttings, maybe the size of my forearm, and just told them to plant and water them. Now, I come from a long line of farmers, but my immediate family did not have the best of luck when it came to gardens. My mom loved to grow tomatoes and peppers so that she could can salsa and tomato sauce every fall. But I still pick on my dad for that time he saw all of my marigolds in a lovely little row and thought they were weeds and pulled them. My mom wasn't especially interested in peaches, but she said, sure, plant them, see what happens. So my dad spaced them about 20 feet apart on the side of the house, and in the ground they went. She would later tell us that she was convinced they would never grow. They wouldn't get enough sun or water, they would get trampled by the small army of children that was in our backyard every summer or somebody would accidentally clip them with the mower. But grow they did. By the second or third year, they had taken root quite well, and they began to flower that spring. Peach blossoms, if you've never been around a peach tree, are incredibly fragrant, and they're gorgeous, almost neon pink in the center, which fades to a lightly dusty rose color at the edges. And then came the peaches. We were absolutely not prepared for the sheer volume of peaches that these trees would produce. Thousands of buds appeared, which grew into peaches the size of small apples. Every summer, for close to 15 years, the branches of those two small trees hung low to the ground with fruit. Between my grandparents' trees and our own, we could not keep up. We canned dozens of jars of fresh peaches every fall in big quart-sized mason jars with nothing but my mom's massive canning pot. We invited the neighbors to take them by the five-gallon bucket. <laughs> One year, I think we even put up a sign out front that said, please take the peaches. <laughs> and they did. The ground around those peach trees was always littered with overripe peaches, which the squirrels and the bees loved. But it meant that everything smelled like peaches. 
But as the trees continued to grow taller and wider, we started to notice that the fruit was getting smaller and smaller every year. We had no idea how to care for these trees in order to produce big peaches, which involved pruning, cutting back the trees, pinching off a certain percentage of the flowers every year to focus the tree's resources, and sometimes preventing it from, from flowering at all for a whole year. So after maybe 10 to 12 years of peaches, they became too small and too bitter to be useful for anything. We wound up instead with nothing but large peach pits with fuzzy skins on them. The trees remained for a few more years, the fruit going entirely to the squirrels by the end, but eventually they were cut down entirely. My mom now grows pumpkins on that side of the house instead, which my nephew turns into jack-o'-lanterns every October. Jesus is the peach tree. We are the branches. But unlike my family, who had no idea what we were getting into, God knows exactly what God is doing. And if you read this passage closely, God is the one caring for this plant, vine, tree. God is the one doing the pruning, clipping off the dead bits and deciding where to focus resources in order to grow the best fruit. God is the one who gathers up the withered branches. Every gardener knows that a branch without roots can't produce any fruit at all. It will quickly wither and die. Jesus tells his disciples over and over again, abide in me and I will abide in you. To expand the metaphor a bit, Jesus is our root system, our source, our nourishment, our anchor. He gave these words to a group of devoted followers who had no idea how messy their lives were about to get. The men would scatter, the women would watch his death and witness his resurrection, and all of them would be very, very afraid. But what he's telling them is very, very simple. When you have no idea what's next, when you are unsure what to do, when you're feeling dried up and wrung out, come back to me. Come back to those days on the side of the mountain when I told you to love your enemies and pray for those who pursue you. Come back to those long hours spent at Martha's table when I told y'all that the good news of God's presence and care is for all people. Come back to the miracles of healing and resurrection and remember that suffering and death is not all there is. Come back to those times we ran together from the religious leaders because I forgave sins without price, reward, or preconditions. Abide in me, says Jesus, and you won't have any trouble growing good fruit. In many ways, this passage also acts as a throwback to a moment from Luke's Gospel, where Jesus reminds the crowds that the thing you plant and water is the thing you will harvest. Thorns aren't going to magically sprout figs. You're not going to get wheat from a wild grapevine. You can't plant and tend bitterness and injustice and expect joy and peace in return. But the reverse is also true. A plant can be known by its fruit. If you see figs, you can assume that that's a fig tree. If you see wheat, you can assume that's not a peach tree. In the same way, our institutions and programs bear fruit. And those things that produce vast quantities of folks who are absolute jerks are probably not actually focused on following Jesus. Every plant is judged by what it produces. 
So what exactly is it that we are supposed to be growing? What results are we supposed to be getting? We'll hear the second half of this passage next week, which gives us a big picture view. But later, Paul's letter to Galatia spells it out very clearly. You can tell the Holy Spirit is at work in something when it produces love, kindness, joy, faithfulness, patience, peace, gentleness, self-control, generosity. You will notice I intentionally did not put those things in the order that we're used to hearing them. Because as soon as I start that list, everybody's eyes glaze over. Yeah, 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 we know. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. In many ways, especially over the last few decades, but really cycling throughout church history, some Christians were led to believe that the only way to abide in Jesus and bear good fruit was to cut yourself off from anything that wasn't explicitly Christian or Jesus-focused or biblically-based. Some folks started cutting off their family members and friends who weren't as devoted to church activities or converted to another faith or denomination or who just left the church altogether. But that is not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is not calling us to circle the wagons and get out the pointy objects. Exactly the opposite actually. For the disciples, this was a reminder to stay close to their original mission. For us, this is an invitation to reevaluate how we interact with the rest of the world, both in what we bring and in what we receive, and choose quality over quantity. When was the last time we had a chance to take a long, hard look at our lives, our activities, our ministries, and say, which of these things are actually producing that kind of fruit? Which programs or events are actually developing your sense of kindness or generosity? What is actually bringing you joy? Which meetings are stretching your patience and self-control? Which friendships and relationships are deepening your ability to love? Because those are the plants you need to water. Some things we do because we have to, like laundry and dishes and paying the electric bill. But so many things we do out of habit not because they add to our lives or contribute to the flourishing of the world, but simply because we've always done them. <coughs> As a friend once told me, you've got to stop watering dead plants. <laughs> For most of us, the pandemic has drastically changed our routines and our habits. And there is an increasing push to go back to normal. And we could simply try to pick up where we left off over a year ago. That is an option. Or we could use this in-between space, somewhere between lockdown and normal life, to experiment a bit, to discern which things we actually want to go back to, to let go of the things that aren't bearing fruit, and discern where we might like to invest ourselves instead. This is hard work, but it is good and holy work. And as we do all of that soul searching, we will continue to gather at this table, where Christ provides food for the body and the soul, where we reconnect with our roots, where we pause to drink in the love and power of the Holy Spirit. As we gather at God's table, let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord. 
Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. Holy and bright it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all of its hosts and the earth with all of its plenty. You have given us life and being, and you preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus the Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is dead. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless might be to us our communion in your body and your blood. Grant that, being joined together in Christ, we might attain to the unity of our faith, just as these grains have been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup. Grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is one of the things that I will not hold on to <laughs> once the pandemic is over. Friends, the same night that he was betrayed, arrested, Jesus sat at table with his disciples. There, he took bread. He blessed God for it. He broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. After they had eaten, he took the cup. He blessed God for it, and he poured it out, saying, This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood. As often as you do this, remember me. A word of instruction. The ushers will dismiss you by rows. You are invited to come up the center aisle where I will meet you with a piece of bread. You can lift your mask and partake of that. And then I'll ask you to go to the sides where the servers will place a cup on the table. We ask you to pick up that cup, lift your mask, partake and then leave the cup in the basket on the end of the table. If you cannot come forward, Lynn, Luke, will come to you. Friends, this is Christ's table. It's not my table, it's not Parkwood's table, it's not even a Presbyterian table. It's Christ's table. And precisely because of that, absolutely everyone is welcome. I invite the servers to come forward Come, 
All things are right.
as we have been nourished in body and soul. Let us pray. God of love, you promise that when we call on you, you are near to us. That as we abide in you, you abide in us. God, we thank you and bless you for your presence within us and among us. And we pray that as you send us out, that we would indeed bear good fruit for ourselves, for our community, and for the world. In Christ's name that we pray. Amen. what we have for the sake of others is a discipline of pruning, letting go of our possessions, our time, and even ourselves to extend the gospel witness into the world. As we give, let us pray. Through we our offerings, O oh God, give your love and spirit to a world in need of comfort. Make, Make our many gifts One of the ways we get to show our loving kindness towards one another and our world by lifting one another up in prayer. So how can we pray for you this morning? I always feel like I need the Jeopardy theme song playing in the back. <laughs> 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 We will certainly continue to pray for all those affected by COVID-19, both in our own communities and around the world, especially in India, where from everything I see from my friends who are in India, um, things are not great there. So we will lift them up in prayer. Anything else on our minds and hearts today? Thank you. Prayers for an end of all the gun violence that's going on in our country. It seems like every day there's a shooting someplace. And last night, I guess it was the one in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, praying for an end to gun violence, and especially for those affected in last night's shooting in Wisconsin. Thank you. Let's go to God in prayer together. <coughs> Holy God, we come to you with lots going on in our minds and our hearts. And we lift up all of those things. It was the psalmist who said, let everything that is in me praise the Lord. And so, God, we come to you with all that we are and all that we have. We pray especially for all those affected by COVID-19, those who are sick, those who are caring for those who are sick, those who are grieving, and those who are afraid. God, we pray especially for the nation of India, that they would be able to bring this outbreak under control, that you would give wisdom, and healing to that country. God, we also pray for all those affected by gun violence. God, we pray that you would show us all of the better ways that there are to solve our problems. We pray especially for those in Wisconsin who are affected by last night's shooting. We pray for those who are grieving, those who are afraid, those who've been traumatized. 
How do we lift this up knowing that this is a problem much bigger than any one person? But we pray that you would give us the resources we need to tackle this problem. We pray for all those in our lives who are struggling, all those who are ill, all those who are dealing with chronic pain, all those who are waiting on test results. We pray your presence for them and for us as we care for them. And God, we rejoice. We rejoice in spring, in the green grass, and the budding leaves, the flowering trees, the daffodils. We give you thanks for all these reminders of resurrection. We pray that you would grant us more and more joy each day in things small and large, so that we may share them with the world. And now we join our hearts and our voices together in the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, in our heart, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you.